Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather tonight uh, to be able to worship through studying your word. God, I pray that as we are working through um, a large chunk tonight, God, I pray that you would give us clarity of thought. I pray that you would give us everything that we need in order to be um, obedient, that you would show us where to apply this, and that, God, that you would uh, show yourself to be good through it. And as is my custom, I would just ask for you to pray for me. If you would, just take a moment and pray that the words I say would be clear and what I would say would be beneficial, and that above all, everything I say would be in harmony with the gospel. If you could uh, pray that for me. So, Father, we thank you for being able to gather. God, I pray that as we are working through John chapter 4, that we would have your spirit here with us, giving us everything we need to be able to comprehend, along with all the saints, the faith that was delivered once for all for us. And God, I pray uh, for myself that even as we are working through a lot of material, um, that I would be clear and be concise as we are working through this, and that, God, that you would be glorified as we talk about this. And so, Father, we give you this time, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so. It's online. I can show you. It's it's on our website. It's like two links, but I don't have the URL memorized in my head. All right, ibcministries.com, and then there's like a couple of places you go from there. We don't actually have a handout for today. No handout for today. So instead, what I have is this. So. This, anybody want to take a stab at who this is? That's your boy, Johnny B. That's your boy, Johnny B. I'm not going to do anything with it. Uh, Joella just, uh, they found it when they were working through some stuff and cleaning out. And so I just wanted to tell you that if you uh, didn't watch the video that I did on YouTube uh, that explains the gap between the last half of John chapter 3 um, and finishes out that chapter, I've got all that on there. I'm not going to reference it again. Go watch it online. If you missed it, you know where it's at. So let's talk about where we were last session. And there's really one main point that I want to make that helps make everything else make sense in John chapter 3. Nicodemus is not regenerate in John chapter 3. He has all this theological orthodox views, but he does not have the Spirit of God working in his life, and he's not regenerate. I don't believe that he's a believer there. When we see him later on in John chapter 7, and then when we see him in John chapter 19, I think that's when we see him as a believer, but I don't think that he's a believer here in John chapter 3. Sue, do you have a question? No, I just wanted okay. to not in John chapter 3. So here's the point to be made from there, is that religious knowledge without the Holy Spirit's activity in your life is useless. It does not save you. And as the, point, uh, the case in point there is Nicodemus. He is a teacher of all Israel. He's a ruler of the Jews. He is a man of the Pharisees. And Jesus says, you have to accept my testimony. Nicodemus' issue is not one of understanding or comprehension. It is one of believing. It is one of accepting the testimony about Jesus. And the whole point that we made at the end of John chapter 3 in our time last session was that we desperately need the Spirit to work in our lives. Yeah? So, um, if you want to, go check out that video on YouTube and you'll get everything you want from John chapter 3, verses 22, all the way through 36. All right, so this is what we are going to do tonight. Um, I told y'all last week that we were going to hit John chapter 4. We're going to go from John chapter 4, verses 1, all the way through verse 42. And I told you to buckle in because it was a whole lot. I have changed my mind. We are not going to cover chapter, one, or chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. We're going to cover chapter 4, verses 1 through 54. Right? So we're going to go even further, and I'll explain why that is um, here in just a moment. Um, the, we were going to cover it, but we were going to split it over next week, and I just realized that it's going to be more beneficial for me to cram it in tonight than it would be to give us one extra week to kind of miss the points that are being made between John chapter 2, 3, and 4, right? I'll explain that as we get there. So uh, I think all that's meant to be read together, so we're going to finish it out tonight. Here is where we are heading ultimately. We're going to talk about the woman at the well, 
This woman, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well in verses 1 through 30. We're going to have four subsections within that. And then we're going to look at verses 31 through 35 where Jesus is uh, teaching his boys about what it means to be a missionary. We're going to look at that in two sections. And then we're going to take 46 through 54 where there's going to be Jesus healing this official son that's there in Cana. And we'll talk about how that's connected with everything else. Once we get done with John chapter 4, then what we're going to do is we're going to revisit these newness and abundance themes that we see in John chapter 2, 3, and 4 together. Yeah? Which is one reason why I've adjusted where we're heading. And then our final thoughts. Yeah? That's where we're heading. There are 54 verses in chapter 4. I am not going to read every one of them. I can't. We will run out of time. So, since this is a fairly familiar story, I'm going to recap the story, and then I'm going to bring our attention to a couple of really key places as we're talking about each section. So, this is what we see in this first section in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Really, 1 through 6, um, but this kind of gives us a preview of what's going on. They were down in Jerusalem. And then Jesus is going to make his way up to Galilee. He's on his way up there. The problem with moving from Jerusalem to Galilee is what's right in the middle? Samaria, right? And so there's a problem. Normally, I say normally, a very well-trodden route for people leaving from Jerusalem to go to Samaria is they would go north about a couple miles, and then they would go east. They would cross the Jordan River, then they would go north, and then they would cross the Jordan again so that they would land back in this area that wasn't Samaritan area. Interesting point here to be made. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, go listen to the video from last uh, week that I put up, um, he said, I got to leave. He left Judea. Verse 5, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So here's the deal. Jesus begins to make his way up to Galilee, and the first place he goes to is this village named Sychar. But if you look in verse 4, there's a really weird word that gets used there. In verse 4 of chapter 4, it says, And he had to pass through Samaria. And so a simple question is, did Jesus have to pass through there? And the answer logically is, no, he did not have to go through Samaria. He didn't. He could have gone a different route. He could have gone up and around through the eastern way, or he could have gone around the longer way in the west. He didn't have to go straight through. However, we know that Jesus doesn't do anything by happenstance here in John. He goes there on purpose, right? And so, that being said, that brings us to a really important point, because where he is going is really pregnant with meaning. So this village of Sychar um, is really near uh, Joseph's well. You can go read about that in Genesis chapter 48, verse 22. Um, but this also is a really important area because not only uh, did Jacob, as I call it Joseph's well, Jacob's well is there, but he and Abraham both actually built altars in that area. You fast forward to Deuteronomy, and Moses specifically mentions this area with Mount Edbal and uh, Gerizim. These are the same areas that's right there near Jacob's well. And so this area is very much contested as to who has more of a claim to it, whether it's the Jews or the Samaritans. And we'll talk more about who the Samaritans actually are here in a bit. Not far from Sychar, not far from Jacob's well, the Samaritans in the year 400 BC had actually built a temple. It basically was meant to be a rival to the temple in Jerusalem. And then about 250 years later, a guy named John Hyrcanus destroyed it. Okay, A Jewish uh, leader of the Hasmonean dynasty destroyed the temple. So here's the deal. Jesus is going to this place that he must go. He had to go there, and it is full of all sorts of problems. In fact, there's all sorts of animosity and taboo at every point of this encounter. Okay? There's animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. After the northern kingdom were absolutely destroyed by the Assyrians, the Assyrians essentially took anyone who had a good name and had any kind of value to them, and they either killed them or they drug them off and they just dispersed them everywhere. And now they had all this empty land, and so they started dragging in hundreds of just various ethnic groups and just sprinkling them all over the northern kingdom. And what ends up happening is the people who remained in the northern kingdom, who were Jewish, intermarried with these people who were of different ethnic identities and religions, and that's where you get Sumerians. They are half Jewish, but they're also half whatever other identity these people come from, right? Because it could be dozens of different identities. 
And so there's this animosity, this temple that was built and then destroyed. That's a problem. Um, you can go read about all this animosity in 2 Kings chapter 17. You can go read about it in Ezra chapter 4 and Nehemiah chapter 4. The main people who are uh, opponents of the Jews in those cases are the Samaritans, right? So there's all sorts of animosities here. When you look in verse 7, this is where we see our story really start to pick up. So Jesus shows up to this well, and what does he see in verse 7? A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, this is where the taboos come in. What are some of the problems culturally with Jesus having this conversation with this woman? What do you know of that would have been culturally taboo for Jesus to be engaging in in this way? He's, he's talking with... It's just a Samaritan. This is a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman. Like, that's a problem, right? Right out the gate, right? Number two. She even says, like, hey, man, what are you doing? Like, you're not supposed to do this, okay? So what are some other taboos that Jesus is going to overcome here? She's a woman. She's unmarried, what we find out. Now, there's a little bit of complexity to that, but she is sitting there, she comes up to the well, and Jesus initiates a conversation. In fact, in uh, some rabbinic traditions, um, it was a fruitless endeavor for husbands to talk to their wives about religious things. It just, that's just how they viewed it, right? And so here you have a rabbi talking to a presumably uneducated woman, right? Not only that, what else do we know about this woman and her lifestyle? She is saying, she came at noon, which is indicating what? She didn't want to come up with the rest of the women. And what we find out from the rest of the story is that she has got some baggage. She is a dirty sinner, right? And Jesus is not, right? So here's some of the things that I want us to see. Uh, D.A. Carson, I love this quote. This is what he says about overcoming these this animosity and these taboos. He says this, Jesus was not a hostage of the sexism of his day. He was not a hostage of the sexism of his day. He had to go to Samaria. He must, because he's going there for her. So let me give us a couple more parallels here, and this will give us one last big step before we look at the text more closely. I think we are supposed to read John chapter 3, and the main figure that Jesus is speaking with there is Nicodemus. And in John chapter 4, the main figure that Jesus is speaking to is this woman. We are meant to compare both of those people and draw some conclusions. So let's do some of that now. Number one, Nicodemus is named. We actually know his name. This woman, not so much. That's not me being derogatory. We don't know her name. It's never given. Not only that, Nicodemus is pretty well educated, right? He's a ruler of the Jews. This woman, presumably is not educated at all. Nicodemus is respected and revered, and he has some clout. Homegirls come into the well in the middle of the day to avoid people. She's ostracized. Nicodemus is Jewish. She's Samaritan. He is a male. She is female. And when did Nicodemus come to Jesus? And when did Jesus encounter this woman? In the middle of the day. So for all their differences, here is the one thing that I think we are to see above all else. Both of them desperately need Jesus. Now with that framework, let's talk about the conversation that happens. Now I'll be the first one to admit to you, it's kind of hard to read uh, this woman's tone, whether she's being snippy or sarcastic, it just doesn't really come across. Um, I think she's probably more genuine than we give her credit for. However, she does try some, some things to get Jesus off of her case, right? It doesn't work, but I do think that she does do some of those things, but she is, um, I think, acting out in genuine interest in this conversation. So, yep, we'll talk about that for sure. So, let's look at verses 7 through 15, and this is where Jesus is going to be talking about this living water. And so here's the story. Jesus is here at this well. This woman comes up, and he addresses her and says, woman, give me a drink. And she replies with, uh, you're not even supposed to be talking to me, man. Like, that's not, this is not appropriate for us to be doing this. And then Jesus replies, if you really knew who you were talking to, you would ask me, not just for a drink, 
but you would ask me and I would give you the free gift that would be living waters that would bubble up to eternal life. And then she responds like, dude, you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get this water? Like, well, come on, man, what's going on here? Here's the first thing I want us to see here. The fact that Jesus is talking with her is shocking. It's shocking. The fact that he just comes out openly and is addressing her directly, and not only is he speaking to her so candidly, he's actually making a request of her, right? Now, and I think this is all in service of him starting this conversation, but if you look through 7 through 8, like all that animosity, all that taboo is still there. And yet, he speaks directly to her. And what you see, um, we mentioned this in John chapter 2, whenever Jesus refers to Mary as Gune, woman, and we said that that wasn't necessarily a term of endearment, but it wasn't one of disrespect. It's the same term he, re he refers to this woman as well, right? And so it's, he's just directly addressing her. And so he says, can I get a drink? And then she says, how can you be asking me? Verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, speaking of himself, and he would have given you living water. And here's what I want you to see. Living water has a dual meaning here. This is another reason why I think we should read John chapter 3 in Nicodemus and John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman parallel. What was the phrase that had dual meaning with Nicodemus? What did Jesus say Nicodemus had to do? Had to be born again, which also means being born from above, right? Born spiritually, right? Here, we're talking about water that's sitting still down there at the well. Another way that you can describe living water is water that moves, just flowing water. That's all it is. So Jesus is saying one thing, living water, but he is piquing her interest by meaning two different things. One, we're about to get this water that's just hanging out down there at the bottom, sitting still, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw it up. Yeah, it's going to be that same water, but if you ask me, I can give you something that's going to be flowing, and it's the gift of God that leads to eternal life. So he is once again engaging in using this very particular phrase to try to pique her interest, and it works. It actually works, because what you see is there in verse 11. Let's read it real quick. The woman said to him, Sir, you got nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water, man? Come on, what are you talking about? And I think she picks up on that flowing water, like, dude, there's no water on the ground. You got to get it from the well, and you got nothing. But here's the deal. Those real obstacles, Jesus overcomes. So she is laying before him something like, this can't happen for this reason. And Jesus is like, ah, that's not what I'm talking about. I got something different. I got something better, right? Read on there in verse 11, at the very end of that, uh, you got nothing to draw the water with. Where do you get this living water? And then verse 12, she says, are you greater than Jacob? I think she's, this is where she's kind of being snarky, but at the same time, like, maybe her interest is peaked as like, what kind of water are we talking about here? Yeah? What kind of water are we really talking about here? I think that this whole idea of this water that Jesus is going to provide to her is something that is so superior that it piques her interest, right? It's like, okay, but if we're talking about the same kind of water, like you, you've got to be better than Jacob somehow, right? Or, or you're not and you're just crazy. Incidentally, Jesus is greater than Jacob, right? He dug the well, yeah, but he doesn't make that water flow. He's not the one who created that water. John chapter 1 tells us clearly that Jesus was intimately involved in the creation of all things, right? And so Jesus absolutely is greater than Jacob. And the fact that Jesus is greater than Jacob, that means he's going to overcome any obstacle. And I think that when she's laying down, you can't do it for these reasons. I think this is a hint to us as the readers to say, oh yeah, you can. And what we know from the rest of the story, because we've read it before, what's one of those obstacles that she's going to lay out? Well, we don't worship the same way. Yeah, I'm going to deal with that. Well, you know, the Christ will settle it all. Yeah, he's here and I'm settling it out. Right? What about her sin? What about her shame? She doesn't bring that up, but Jesus knows. And he's going to overcome that, and she'll have this living water. So, I think what the point here is that Jesus is offering to satisfy her eternally. 
right? He is offering to satisfy her eternally. He's greater than Jacob. Let's pick it up there in verse 13. Are you greater than Jacob? Yeah, is the answer. Verse 13, everyone who drinks of the water here will be thirsty again. It does not matter how much water you drink at any one time. It does not matter how frequently you drink water or if you f drink uh, an inordinate amount of water at any given interval, you will still need more water. What Jesus is saying is like, yeah, that water that's way down there, it's really deep. Get all you want, and you're going to need more. But what I'm going to give you, you only need it once, and you'll never need it again. And I think this is him pointing to, I'm going to satisfy you, not just with your real world issues. You're here to get water. Like, that's, that's evident. We're going to need to talk about that. But at the same time, he says, I'm going to give you something that will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then I think this is where we have some genuine response. She actually wants that. She actually wants this satisfaction. Verse 15, sir, give me this water. She's got a bucket, get it yourself. If she understood what he was saying to mean living water is just, it's down there in the well, she could have just gotten it, right? Every day. But she comes to Jesus and says, you give me what you're offering because I want it. Are you seeing how this is working out? So Jesus initially throws the bait out there about this living water. It's got two different meanings to kind of drive to this bigger point that he's wanting to make about how he's going to satisfy her every need eternally. And she bites. She takes the bait. And so now we're in a conversation, yeah? Questions about 7 through 15 right now? All right, so then what we have in verses 16 through 26 is where Jesus is going to talk about true worship. Sir, give me some of this water that you're talking about. And I think that this is her being genuine and saying, I, I want to know more of what you're talking about. But Jesus doesn't just immediately leap into, okay, cool, well, this is what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to have the Holy Spirit come in your life. He doesn't do that. Instead, what does he do? Hey, go get your husband. Go get your husband. And she's like, oh, I don't have one. He's like, yeah, I know. You've had five, and the dude you woke up next to this morning isn't your husband either, is he? Why did he do that? Why, when she bit, I mean, she's on the hook, why doesn't Jesus just immediately start sharing this gospel truth for her? And my contention is, I think he needs to demonstrate to her that he knows what her deepest longing is and what she is looking for in satisfaction. He knows what it is, and he's highlighting that's not going to eternally satisfy what I give you will. And so he's got to put his finger in her chest and say, this is what you're seeking to satisfy, and it never does. He needs to demonstrate to her how big her need is. And not only that, he's demonstrating his omniscience. Go get your husband. I don't have one. Yeah, I know. You've had five for whatever reason, and the dude you woke up next to isn't your husband. He has no reason to know that unless he's divine. And what we said over and over with the Gospel of John is that every time that Jesus shows some kind of um, attribute of his divinity, whenever he is having these conversations, he is driving towards bringing them a point of making a decision. And here's the deal. As he is demonstrating his omniscience, he is demonstrating that she is morally messy at best. Morally messy. She's looking for this physical satisfaction with the water, but what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to give you spiritual satisfaction, which is going to be much more than that. But here's the deal. When it comes to her moral messiness, Jesus doesn't seem to be phased by it, does he? In fact, go back to John chapter 4, verse 4, and he had to go to Samaria because he had an appointment, it seems like. He was there for her. He's not dissuaded by the moral messiness. He's motivated by it, and he goes to her. I think there's some kind of lesson there for us as believers. I don't know what it is about us not being phased by people's sin. I, I don't know. Maybe y'all are smart enough to figure out what the, the point to be made there is, because I don't get it, right? He's not dissuaded by her moral mess. He enters into it. So, after confronting her about her lifestyle, what does she say in verse 19? Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Let me ask you a question. Uh, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but y'all say it's that one. Which one is it? 
And so what she does, she tries to distract Jesus, but what do we know about how this works out? Distracting Jesus never really works, right? Because he does like the, the mental judo to take her question and he flips it back on her and says, yeah, you're worried about location and that's not the issue. In fact, there's coming a day whenever the location doesn't matter. In fact, so much, the hour is coming. Let's pick it up there in verse 23. But the hour is coming and what does your Bible say? The hour is coming and it's now here. The hour is coming. Actually, matter of fact, let me, let me correct you on a fact. It's here now. It's now here because I'm talking with you and it says the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for the Father's looking for that kind of person to worship him. Doesn't matter what, uh, what mountain you choose, that's not what it's about. And so what Jesus says is I'm the one who transforms what true worship looks like. Incidentally, don't you kind of hear echoes of that conversation with Nicodemus? You got to be born again, guy. How are we supposed to do that? Like, I thought you were a teacher of Israel. I thought you understood that this is the way this worked. And here, Jesus is plainly saying, I'm the one that transforms how we worship. The hour is coming, and it's here now because I'm here now. It's different now in spirit and in truth. This is what I think about that. In spirit and truth is not in spirit, one idea, and in truth, a second idea. No, no, no. Those are one idea, one thing, in spirit and truth. Think of it as like one long compound idea. In spirit, because it is animated by the Holy Spirit, which is the singular thing that Nicodemus didn't have from John chapter 3, right? Our worship is transformed because our hearts have been transformed and it's in spirit and it's in truth because it is us genuinely worshiping a God who has saved us. Incidentally, I also think this is a bit of a dig right back at her. She says, hey, settle a, settle a dispute for me about our worship. You Jews say it's over there. We Samaritans say it's over here. The way the Samaritans ended up with the form of worship that they had in Jesus' day, they basically took the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, and they basically took everything else out and said, this is all we need. And that's how they built their worship. And so I think this is a subtle way that Jesus is going, hey, you remember all those different ways where God revealed how we're supposed to worship him and what he was going to do with the Messiah and sending you or sending me to come? He's basically making a dig at her and saying, you're going to do it the right way. And, and I'm right here telling you how we're going to do it now. Yeah. True worship is transformed by Jesus. We worship in spirit and truth. And then the most miraculous thing in this whole conversation happens. Actually, there's one more thing. Verse 24. God is spirit. Why does Jesus throw that comment out there? Why does Jesus throw out there that God is spirit? And I think it's because you're asking a question about whether it's that mountain or this one. And what Jesus says is, no, 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 no. Like Jesus, or excuse me, the Father is not entombed in some body and therefore relegated to one place at one time. He's saying God's omniscient, or excuse me, omnipresent. He is everywhere at all times. So it doesn't matter as long as you're doing it in spirit and in truth. And so he throws out there, our God is spirit, and those who worship him, they must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, hey, I know that we're talking about some really heavy things. Some of this stuff is above me. But I know that when the Messiah comes, he's going to, he's going to teach all this. He's going to clear it all up. And what does Jesus say to her? I'm him. I'm clearing it up right now. We're talking about it right now. This is the way we do it. And this is incredibly fascinating because Jesus is, is revealing his identity as the Messiah to whom? This Samaritan chick who is morally messy, who's uneducated. Incidentally, I think one of the reasons for this is we, we see Jesus confirm his Messiahship whenever he's on trial later in John chapter 18, 19. But this is the only other time that Jesus does that. And yet he does it to the Samaritan woman. And I think part of the reason for that is she is not wrapped up in the Jewish conception of what the Messiah is going to do. The Jews thought the Messiah is going to come. He's going to overthrow the Romans. He's going to set up this new kingdom. He's going to set up this eternal kingdom. Samaritans didn't think that. And so now, since that's not an issue that he has to contend with over and over with, with the Jews, he can clearly tell her, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm here. I'm setting it straight right now, me and you. Spirit and truth, not there, not over here, and spirit and truth, you've got to have God work in your life. Yeah? 
And what I think is going on there is that this is John's way of giving us a hint of God's global mission. Anthony preached on Sunday that God has a worldwide plan of salvation and evangelism for the rest of the world. It started with the Jews in John chapter 3 with this cat named Nicodemus. It goes to these half-Jewish folks named the Samaritans in John chapter 4. And at the end of John chapter 4, my contention is there's a Gentile dude, a guy who is a bureaucrat who works for the oppressors. He works for the Romans. When you go look in Acts, you see the gospel taking root there in Jerusalem. Where's the next place it goes? Samaria. And after that, Peter has this run in with this cat named Cornelius, who is a centurion, right? Centurion? That's a Roman dude? Army guy? The whole point here is that I think that when you look at John chapter 2, 3, and 4, you start seeing these hints of how Jesus is operating and he is working out God's global plan for salvation. And it's right here in the opening chapters of John. Yeah? All right. Questions about 16 through 26? Say again. Why would it have been easier for Jesus to witness to her than some old Jew? She, she, wasn't, uh, she wasn't set in the Jewish way. Right. right. And so she is other specifically. But I do think that those animosities and taboos are still there. And we'll talk about that again here in just a little bit when we wrap up the rest of the story. But I think your point's well taken is that somebody has to go, right? And in this case, who's the one who's setting the example? Jesus is setting the example for all of us to follow, right? We'll run that to the ground here in just a bit. Let's look at verses 27 through 30. So as soon as he tells her, hey, I am the Messiah, what happens? Verse 27, and then the disciples show up, <laughs> right? And then they start thinking, like, what is going on? Like, why is Jesus talking to this chick? How long have they been talking? What is happening? And thank God they don't ever actually voice it because they don't show that same restraint later in the Gospel of John, but they just kind of internalize these questions, right? And so what we see is the disciples are marveling. Let me give you another word. They are shocked that Jesus is doing this. Jesus, what are, man, we just came here to get some food and move on, man. We can't be hanging around. Like, get your food, let's eat, and let's leave. And you're sitting here having a conversation that it seems like y'all been talking some deep stuff, man. Homegirl is shook. And then the next thing that happens is she takes off and leaves her water jar and she goes to the village. Now, there's one of two things that are possibly happening here. One... John, being an eyewitness here, records a detail that only an eyewitness would remember. Hey, by the way, man, I remember whenever homegirl left. You remember how she left her water jar? That was crazy. She just took off. And it's just a detail that he's adding in there. But what do we know about John? What do we know about John is that he sees deeper meaning in everything. So what do you think that water jar is there for? Why does John record that for us? She's giving up on this water. She doesn't need it anymore. She's given up on it. She leaves this water jar, and I think just symbolically that's her old lifestyle, right? She was trying to find this sense of satisfaction with these relationships with men, and it wasn't working. Hey, you guys, you've had five husbands, and the dude you woke up next to this morning isn't your husband either, and that's, that's not going to satisfy Hey, come get some of this water. Actually, you don't even need it. Just go on, take off. And she leaves her water jar there. I think that is indicative of the life change that we see with her. And not only that, we can actually read a little bit more about that. Pick it up in verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, what does your Bible say? Huh? Said to them. What, is, what does she say to the people? Come and see. The exact same words that we saw at the close of John chapter 1 with the message. Actually, let's just turn there. Go to John chapter 1 there at the very end. Look at verse 26. Nathaniel said, man, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And his boy Philip said, hey, bro, come find out for yourself. Come and see. The next time we see those two words, this woman who had just abandoned her lifestyle and that water jar is emblematic of that, and she goes and tells everybody a simple message of, this dude told me everything that I was trying to find satisfaction in. You need to come see this dude. 
And the point here is that her testimony was alluring. Because what we end up seeing is that everybody starts coming out, starts talking to Jesus, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But here's the point that I want to make for us right now. Whenever I was in college, there was a guy named John Paul that I led a Bible study with. First time I ever led a Bible study, going through 1 John, was with him. And uh, one night I was actually doing training at the BCM and uh, training students on how to share their testimony. And John came up to me afterwards like, man, I, I love hearing your story. You were saved at 18. You got this crazy story with being in the military. God got a hold of your life. And just like, that testimony is crazy. Dude, I, just, I was born in church. Like, I became a believer when I was seven, and it's boring. He's like, man, he said these words, I wish I had your story. And here's how I know that, like, I was speaking better than I knew, because in that moment, and I remember clearly telling him, hey, I just want you to know that whenever I have kids, I pray they have your story. And I think I shared with y'all last week, that's literally what I've been praying for the last six years with my kids is that God would save them at an early age. Do not ever discount your story. Don't ever. Because at its core, this is a story of God miraculously saving someone from death to life. I don't care if you were born on the pew or if you were saved in prison, it doesn't matter. Your testimony is alluring because it's not about you. It's about the one who saves you. And so what happens here is that she says, hey, come and see. So all that's going on, and we'll pick up here in just a second. Sue. Mm-hmm. On purpose, you know, if she came their way, they turned their back. Yep. Yet God used her witness to go, and she immediately brought the crowd of people. Mm-hmm. It wasn't they. They didn't say, "Go away." You know, we'll see how this works out for you. Yep. So. So yep. Keep going. So the comment there is the people that she was telling come and see knew what kind of lifestyle she had, right? In fact, in my mind, I think that actually makes it even more uh, remarkable, right? They knew. Those taboos of like, oh, so a Jewish guy just started talking to you and like now things are changing? Like, yeah, the answer to that is yes, yes. And so the whole point there is that the story of Jesus saving and interacting with her and what change he brings about in her life, that is what is so important. Not that it's you, but it's your story about him. Yeah? When she got back to town, she said, could this be the Messiah? And I think that's her saying, like, hey, guys, y'all got to come and find out for yourself. She knew. knew. I, I think she knew, right? So... In between everyone coming from the town and talking to Jesus and her leaving to go get everybody, then we get this little scene with Jesus and the disciples, and this is how it goes down. Hey, Jesus, we went and got this food for you. You should probably eat it, right? Like, we we need to, dude, we need need to leave. Like, get your food. Let's eat. Let's leave, okay? Like, we've we've done enough of this. I don't know what was going on with you and homegirl over there, but, like, let's leave. And what does Jesus say? Actually, yeah, let's get that bread. Let's bring it out. Let's, Let's spend some time here. In fact, he goes, guys, I got food y'all don't even know nothing about. And they are like, did this dude like go get some food? Like, what's he talking about? Like, did he bring some that we didn't know about? Why didn't he share it, right? He completely sidesteps their misgivings as well. Pick it up there in verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him to eat, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I got food to eat that you don't know nothing about. And it's called doing my father's will, right? So the disciples urging me, and what Jesus returns back to them is, you need to be obedient. You need to do what it is that the father's telling you to do. Um, This is one of those key themes that you see all over in John, is that Jesus is incredibly concerned with doing the will of the father. I'm about to rattle off a whole list of verses. Don't try to write them down. You're not going to be able to. 
I've got it recorded. I'll come give you the notes up here afterwards. Check this out. John chapter 5, verse 30, 638, 826, 94, 1037 through 38, 1249 through 50, 1431, 1510, 174, and then 1930, the last words of Jesus and John are, it is finished. Tetalista. He says, guys, like, yeah, I know we're hungry, but there's something more important going on here. And it's about being obedient to what God had me come here for. I had to come to Samaria. Y'all thought we just happened to show up here on accident? Jesus is urging them to do God's will because that's what he is doing. He's setting that example. It goes on there in verses 35 through 36. Say again. We'll, we'll get there. So in verse 35, he uses a colloquial saying of like, yeah, man, the harvest is going to be here in four months. And the implication is, so don't rush things. Take your time. Four months from now, then we'll get to work. But what Jesus says in verse 34 and 35 is, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who weeps is re or reaps is receiving its wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. He ain't talking about some field. He's talking about something more than that. So that the sower may rejoice, or and the reaper may rejoice together. Here's the point. What he's saying is that every one of us have a role to play. Whenever you go look in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38, and you've seen other references like this when Jesus is saying, hey man, the, the harvest field is ripe, it's ready. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out there and let's get to work. Here's what I know about Jesus. Number one, he's not a liar. So when he says the harvest field is ready and that we need workers, we should be ready to work and go into the harvest field, period. That's all there is to it. He's not a liar. And so when he, he references this colloquial saying of like, yeah, in four months we'll really get busy. He's saying, guys, y'all went to go get food and you thought that that was the break. I've been working this whole time. I've been working this whole time, and what y'all need to do is learn that whenever I'm needing to go away, y'all will do the work. Everyone has a part to play here. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. Let's look at verse 37 and 38. Pray, he, or for, excuse me, for here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Here's his point. Guys, God's been working well before you ever showed up. He has been at work long before you ever showed up. We've all got a part to play, but you're not the one who's running this entire process to the ground where you're the one who's tilling and planting and watering and reaping and then later discipling, discipling and doing this, all this other stuff. His point is God is the one who's been at work all along. In fact, go to John chapter 3, verse 37. 37? Nope. 27, that's a better one. John chapter 3, verse 27. This is your boy, Johnny B. This will probably be one of the last times I actually reference him for a while. And John answered, speaking about his disciples, saying, hey man, Jesus' disciples, they're baptizing more guys than we are. Like, what do you want us to do about that? And this is what John says. Your boy, Johnny B. answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. And then he goes on to say, I got to decrease, he's got to increase. The whole point is, John was saying, I am only here because God has appointed for me to be here to do this work now. He has been at work long before us. He will be at work after us, most likely. But in the meantime, we must be the ones who do God's will. When it comes to the Great Commission, there is either adherence to or disobedience of. There is no third option. And you cannot make disciples if you're not being one yourself. And so when Jesus is having this conversation with his boys, just keep in mind, there's people from the crowds from the village who are just coming up to him. And so Jesus is saying, hey, y'all ready to get to work? Let's get to work. Let's pick it up there in verse 39. We're going to see this village is transformed. Everyone starts coming and talking to him. Verse 39, many Samaritans from the town believed in him why? What does verse 39 say? Because of what she said. But that's not actually where the story ends. So her testimony was alluring, but here we get the rest of the picture. Her testimony was effective. Hey, come and see for yourself. 
what do they do? They come find out. They come to him and they believe. In fact, it goes on to say there in verse uh, 40, So when Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay, and he stayed two days. And many more believed because of his word. How long did Jesus stick around for? Two days. His boys are like, hey, get the food, let's eat and leave. Jesus, please stay. Gotcha. Because Jesus is comfortable in the messiness. You do realize those animosities and taboos didn't just go away. They are still there. And now it's not one Jewish rabbi, it's this one Jewish rabbi and his ragtag group of dudes who are following him. And now they are having to engage with these people in mass. But Jesus is comfortable with it because that is what the Father has for him to do. So, what we see from there is that Jesus' word now becomes instrumental. He's sharing with them. I'm certain it's the content that we can extrapolate from John chapters 2, 3, and 4 about newness and abundance, and we'll talk about that here in a bit. But the whole point there is that after they are convinced of this, look in verse 42. They said to the woman, hey man, you're crazy. You kind of got morally messy. This is wild. But they say to her, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We have heard for ourselves. And what do they call him? The Savior of the world, because Jesus indeed is the Savior of the world. In fact, the only other time that phrase gets used in the New Testament is by John in 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, talking about God's global plan for salvation. And it's not on the lips of the Jews, it's on the lips of these Samaritans, who have been convinced because of this woman's testimony, who Jesus told me everything I ever did. He put his thumb right on the one thing I was trying to find satisfaction in, and he showed me it wasn't going to satisfy. And so I believed in him. You, you should come find out for yourself. Come and see. And what do they do? They come and see. And they call him the Savior of the world. Once again, that's Jesus and John hinting at this global plan of salvation. And then after two days, he heads up to Galilee, goes back to Cana. Yeah? So that completes, in many ways, or it will here in a moment, the Cana in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, with the water into wine, the wedding at Cana. He leaves, goes to Jerusalem, and now he comes back up to Sychar, and then he makes his way over back to Cana. And that's where we find the real bow on this whole story, is in the very last verses of this chapter, you see this Gentile official and his son being saved from death. And what I contend is this Gentile official and his entire household receive salvation. They head up to Galilee, verse 46. He came to Canaan and Galilee, where he turned water into wine. Why do, you think, why do you think John tells you that? Why do you think he reminds you of that? It's because he wants you to read John chapter 2, 3, and 4 together. These are important. I'm setting some paradigms. Pay attention. So he comes back to this place where he turned water at the wine, no, into wine, and there's a man who came to Jesus. And here's the deal. This dude's son was near death three different times. You can look there in verse 46, verse 47, and verse 49. Those three times, this dude's son is described as being on the verge of death. He is about to die. This father is out of options. He leaves Capernaum and goes... Capernaum? Is that right? Yeah, Capernaum. He leaves Capernaum and comes to Cana because he hears there's a guy there who might be able to help, and he leaves to go get this dude to get him some, his son some help. And Jesus initially says no. Incidentally, it's the exact same method that he used back in John chapter 2, 1 through 12, with the water and the wine. Hey, servants, do whatever Jesus says. And Jesus is like, woman, what does this have to do with me? He initially rebuffs, but then in his grace, he does what is being requested of him. And so this official says, Jesus, you've got to help. By the way, the word that gets used here for this Gentile, um, basili basilikos is the word. Basilikos. And that word comes from basileus, which just means king. And so a basilikos was someone who was a nobleman, a courtier, or someone who was like a bureaucrat who worked for a king. There is no king in this area, but you know what there is? An emperor. <laughs> this cat most likely is a, a bureaucrat for the Rome. So he is a representative of the oppressors. 
And when Jesus hears this guy's uh, request, he saves him. He saves him. Nicodemus, he didn't get it. Woman at the well, she got it. And the whole village got it. This dude, he gets it. We went from the Jews to the Samaritans, and now what I contend is a Gentile. Maybe he's Roman, maybe he's something else, whatever. But he's a representative of the oppressors. And Jesus saves him. And then after some back and forth, the official figures out, hey, when exactly did all this go down? And his servants are like, oh, it was this time yesterday. And that was the moment Jesus said, hey, your son's healed, you can go home. And when he hears that, things change. Look with me there in verse 52, halfway through it. Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Verse 53, the father knew that this was the hour when Jesus said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed. And what else? His whole household. What's 48 mean? Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. I think this is Jesus, this is him rebuffing, saying, look, you think I'm just a miracle worker? And I'm just here to do party tricks. That's not what I'm here to do. And this guy keeps on. My son is about to die. This ain't about party tricks. This is my son. And then Jesus hears him and goes, he's good. He's saved. He's, he, he will live. And then this guy, when he gets home, he hears about this demonstration of Jesus' power and says, I, I believe. And not only him, but his whole household. And in fact, John helps us out in verse 54. Now, this is the second sign. And remember, those signs are meant to point towards something, and that pointing towards is faith in Christ. So, that's all of John chapter 4. I think it is meant to be read in conjunction with 2, 3, and 4, because there's some real paradigms that are being set. So, let's talk about some of those themes real quick. We talked about newness and abundance, and this is how John chapter 2, all the way through the end of John chapter 4, are meant to be read together. Let me give you a couple of these. In 2, 1 through 12, the water into wine, there's new wine, and that's emblematic of the coming messianic age and blessing and abundance, right? There has to be new wine. And then when Jesus clears out the temple, he says, I'm the temple. My body is the temple. Destroy this thing, and in three days, I'll bring it back up, right? There's a new temple. And then he's talking to Nicodemus, and he says, you must be born from above. Got to have a new birth. And what we see from this woman, and with her leaving her water pot, I think that's emblematic of new life. New lifestyle. Yeah, an old hymn. There you go. And so that's the Samaritan woman in 1 through 30. And I didn't have a new on this one, so we're going with true. True nourishment. When he's talking to his boys and they're like, hey, eat some of this bread we got so we can leave. And Jesus is like, I've got food you don't know anything about, and it's called obedience. Newness, abundance, provision, this nourishment, this food that I have, you, you will learn. You'll get there. You're not there yet, but you'll get there. And I think this is why all of John 2, 3, and 4 need to be read together and kind of hold it all in our head, which is the reason why I didn't stop um, in covering the last you know, dozen verses or so in John chapter 4 because I needed us to see this, all right? So let's hit our final thoughts, and then we've got five minutes, six minutes or so for questions. Here we go. Number one, no one is too far gone for Jesus to save, period. Not someone with this messy morality who's been married five times before and woke up next to someone who wasn't their spouse. Not some official, this bureaucrat for the oppressors. Not some ruler of the Jews. There is no one who is too far gone for Jesus to save. In fact, whenever we were at chapel earlier today, Shane Pruitt said that, yeah, we're all really good sinners, but Jesus is a better savior. He's better at saving than you are at sinning. There is no one who is too far gone for Jesus to save. And number two, our worship is animated by the Spirit. When Jesus talks about that we will worship in spirit and in truth, these true worshipers, there is something about the way we worship that has nothing to do with our physical surroundings. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what has happened internally in us, that the Spirit has given us new life and that we are now being caused to worship in a new way regardless of physical location, right? So our worship must be animated by the Spirit. The woman at the well leaves her jar, her water jar, because she recognizes that lifestyle is not going to satisfy. And here's my point. I think Jesus satisfies your greatest needs. 
not just eternally, but I think the thing that she was trying to fill in that need with relationships or whatever it may be, he put his thumb right on that issue and says, this has got to go. I can give you something better. I think Jesus will do the exact same thing for you if you let him. Evangelism is life-giving for everyone involved. I think it's really clear for us to say, yes, whenever someone comes to faith and they trust in Christ, we celebrate that. We celebrate them whenever they get baptized, and that's all a good party. But you do realize that you sharing is life-giving as well. And this is what we talked about on Sunday night, that it's not about you. The results are not about how well you did this. However, what Jesus says is, it is my food to do the will of the Father. And what I know clearly from John chapter 1, starting in verse, even the last bit there in 35 all the way through the end of the chapter, is following Jesus necessarily means telling others about him. Nicodemus, he doesn't go tell anybody else about Jesus because I don't think he's saved. This woman at the well leaves her water jar, and where does she go? Makes a beeline and starts telling folks about it. This official, he believes, but then also his household. Do you think they just happened to like, oh, we believe in this guy we've never met and we don't know the rest of the story? No, he told them. Following Jesus necessarily means telling other people about him, and that process of evangelism is life-giving for us, even if you get blown up in your attempt to share the gospel. Even if. And here's the big one. We all remain in our spiritual death apart from life that comes from Jesus. The way that he saves us and the way that we exercise our faith and belief and trust in him, we repent of sins and we trust in him. Apart from that, you're Nicodemus in John chapter 3. You're in darkness. That's all there is to it. So what do we need? We need the spirit to work. We need to hear and respond to this message of salvation. And then once we are out of this spiritual death and now that we have this living water that wells up to eternal life, we then go tell others about it. I don't. I don't think he is in John chapter three. I don't think he's Nicodemus. Well, and that's my point: is that he hasn't had the very thing because this is from last week. Were you here last week? Okay, so from last week, go watch it. And I'll talk all about it. But the whole point there is that the thing that Jesus puts his thumb on is saying, "You have not been born again. You don't receive my testimony about who I am, and therefore you're lost as a goose." Yeah, Rich. Nicodemus had more baggage than the woman at the well. Yeah. Yeah. When we think about the rich young ruler, he comes up to Jesus and he's flouting his, his credentials. Like, hey, I've kept the law ever since I was a little kid. And what Jesus does is goes, hey, well, then go sell everything and come follow me. And the dude's like, oh, no, not going to do that. And Jesus' comment was, it's harder for a rich man to enter in the kingdom than it is for someone Who's got nothing? And I think in a parallel way, somebody who has been, been very clear that they have the right orthodox theology, but they don't have what actually matters, that's a big bridge. To ga- that's a big gap to a bridge. It is. Which is one reason why I think it is such an insipidous issue that we have people that are in churches and have been members for decades and are not regenerate. And they think they're saved, and they're not because I've been doing Sunday school, I've been coming to church, I've served, I've done that. And the one question is, well, do you have this saving faith that comes from trusting in Jesus? Well, I mean, but I show up every Sunday. That's not what I asked. So. Where are we going next week? To the pool of the we'll, we'll handle John chapter five, we'll recount that. So I still got a couple more minutes. Any other questions you got? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, so the comment there is that the way that Jesus handled the conversation with Nicodemus and the way he handles the conversation with the woman at the well, it seems like Jesus is more gentle with her. I, I would draw two parallels. 
every time that Nicodemus responded or had some comment, Jesus actually went further. He had even more to say. You actually see the same thing happening here. So in the same way, he actually does the exact same model. However, I can't tell the text doesn't convey tone, whether she was being snarky, but when she says, sir, give me this living water, I find that kind of hard not to read that she's being genuine. And whereas Nicodemus was being genuine in some of his questions, they also had this undertone of like, this can't be. Yeah, I, I, and that's exactly it. I don't believe you because literally that's what Jesus says is you don't accept our testimony. The testimony of me and the Father, we say you must be born again and you don't believe it. So then you got no shot. But for her, after he demonstrates his divinity, after he shows how much he knows about her, then I think she's like, oh, this is a different conversation. I think so. I think so. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Yep. And you can see how much uh, that they've learned in that time. Yep. So the comment there is that you can see this progression from the disciples. And I think, yeah, especially the further we look on, there's going to be times that, especially, again, I think that John assumes that we are familiar with the synoptics. At this point, Peter has already said some pretty, some pretty loud things, right? Um, we're about to end at that point where some pretty clear uh, comments from Peter are going to show that this dude has still got a lot of growing to do, right? Mark 8 and Mark 9, you start seeing some of that come out. However, by the time we get to the end of the book, when we get to the epilogue, um, let's just turn there real quick. If you got your Bible still, go to John. We're going to pick it up there at the very end of verse, was it 22? I'm sorry, 21, 22? 21, 22. The refrain that Peter gets whenever Jesus confronts him about his sin and denying him and then restores him, Peter almost immediately messes up again. Almost immediately. And this is what we see in verse 22. Well, let's pick it up in verse 21. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, talking about John the Apostle, what about this guy? What, what, what do you want him to do? And what does Jesus do? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? What is it that Peter's supposed to do? Just follow, me. follow me. The exact same words that he got at the very beginning. It's the exact same words you get now. It's the exact same words that Peter is going to be living by all the way up until he is martyred. And so the point there is like, yes, there is this progression, but there's also setback. And I think that's one reason why it's such a big deal to see that Jesus can save anyone. Yeah? Any final comments, questions, gripes, complaints, concerns? R.O.? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The questions that we have about our relationship with God and what he's doing with someone else, God's not concerned with. He's concerned with what, are, what have I told you to do? How have I equipped you? Go do it, right? That's what he's far more concerned with. Yeah. All right. Let me pray for us. An hour and three minutes. Dang it. Joella, I told you not to let me go this long. I'll blame you on this one. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for what our brother John has written for our instruction. God, we thank you for what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross. And Father, I just want to pray along with our brother Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And God, that we thank you, the Father, for your foreknowledge. Holy Spirit, we thank you for sanctifying us in a way that only you can. And Jesus, we thank you for sprinkling us with your blood and calling us to obedience. Help us be obedient this next week.
And we pray this in his name. Amen. If you wanted to come get some notes, I got them up here. 